Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully having an amazing day. A major leak has occurred for Zen 4. And we now have some actual very interesting details concerning what AMD have done under the hood for this upcoming architecture. Zen 4, and specifically Raphael, the AM5 platform as well, is going to launch the end of this year. And I have to say that the direction AMD are going here is rather interesting. We'll discuss it in just a moment, right after this message from our sponsor. Did you just build a shiny new PC? Then you'll need a genuine copy of Windows 10 so you can personalize the system and of course get rid of that annoying activation watermark. We've partnered with WhoKeys to give you guys great discounts on Windows 10 keys. And of course they can be fully upgraded to Windows 11 too. You can get 30% off using the coupon code RGT during checkout. I've purchased several of these keys in the past using a personal non-RGT affiliated account and they've worked flawlessly with quick delivery. If you want to pick up a copy of Windows for as little as $15 or a cheap and legit copy of Office, check the links out in the video description below. So as a quick recap then, Raphael and AM5 are going to be releasing end of this year and AMD have already given us some key indications of what they're doing with the platform. Uh, one of the big things that we've learned thanks to a recent interview with Frank Azer is that this is going to be a long life platform and is going to last uh, successive generations as well. So of course that means Zen 4, Zen 5 and so on. There are going to be some major fundamental improvements over what we have with AM4, including of course DDR5 support, which is probably going to be more important for things like APUs, especially if they start to increase the uh, cache like Infinity Cache and all of this stuff as they move to RDNA 2 and later GPU architectures. It's going to have technology like PCIe Gen 5 and all of this other stuff. But but really, I think most folks are perhaps more interested in Zen 4 itself. To my understanding, it's going to be kind of an evolution of Zen 3, whereas Zen 5 is going to be a really pretty big departure in terms of the architectural design. But yeah, performance of this thing is looking to be very impressive. AMD themselves have basically told us that it's going to hit an all-core of 5 GHz+, plus, although they're being really cagey as to IPC and final clock frequencies. At the end of the day, this is still pretty early silicon, so final clock frequencies are not exactly easy to understand yet anyway. They can kind of have kind of predictions, but that's about it. But, yeah... <laughs> I suspect that it's going to be a very interesting fight between uh, Zen 4 and Raptor Lake, which of course is going to be released by Intel uh, later part of this year as well, which is naturally a successor kind of to Alder Lake. Either way, there has been a leaked benchmark, well actually two leaked benchmarks to be accurate, of both an 8 and a 16 core Zen 4 processor. Now it's worth noting that of course any benchmark can technically be faked, so it is possible these are not accurate, and furthermore these are engineering samples, so we don't really know the rest of the system configuration and we also don't know the state of the engineering samples that are being tested here. Are they really early samples? Are they, for example, earlier than what AMD was showing off at their event? What's the clock frequency? What about memory time? You know, there's a billion things, basically, but let's get into it. I would like to, however, quickly give a credit to the individual who discovered this. I believe the person who discovered it was Bench Leaks. And yeah, so if we go to Boink, I think that's how you pronounce it, and I'm going to choose to pronounce it Boink because it pleases me. We have two AMD engineering samples. I won't read out the full code names because I'll be here until Christmas next year, but 665-21 underscore N, and that's Family 25 Model 6, uh, sorry, Model 96, excuse me. So that is a 16-core 32-thread processor, and its brother is 666 dash 21 underscore n and this is half the number of cores and threads so we have a eight core 16 thread processor and if we have a quick peruse over the rest of the specifications here we can't really ascertain too much again number of processors for example in uh, the 666 benchmark is being listed as 16 because it's counting the uh, smt threads and we can see the model, uh, sorry, the performance metrics we have here. The operating system is Linux Ubuntu. Um, you can read out all of the details there. I'm not going to read out the um, operating system versions and stuff. And the Boink, I'm sorry, that pleases me way too much to say Boink. 7.16.6, .6, memory is 30.57. But 
The real takeaway here is that the cache is being shown as 1024 kilobytes. Now, the reason that this is so interesting is because cache, to my understanding, and it seems to be, you know, what I'm reading online, for this particular benchmark is actually L2 cache. So naturally, when we look at, say, Zen 3, um, each core has... 512 kilobytes of its own level 2 cache though each processor sorry each processor core has l1 l2 well technically there's different types of l1 but let's just not worry about that we've got l1 cache l2 cache and then of course you've got the chunky l3 cache which multiple uh, cpu cores share so 512 kilobytes for zen 3 and this seems to be doubled here with zen 4 and one of the very interesting things, I'm pretty sure I discussed this in a video, I'll try to remember to link it down below, but I've been hearing that Zen 5, which naturally is a successor, is going to have hybrid cores, that's quite well understood at this point, but the little cores, quote unquote, are basically going to be an evolution of Zen 4 cores. Now, my understanding is that one of the big differences between Zen 4 that we're getting here, Raphael, and the ones which are going to be found in uh, Zen 5 for the little cores, is that we actually have more L2 cache per core, but the L3 cache is being neutered. So it's going to be quite interesting because theoretically this could mean that what? We get like 2 megabytes of L2 cache per core? Or perhaps AMD have done, you know, I, I honestly don't know at this point. It's it's just highly interesting. The performance, though, of Zen 4 is going to be pretty mind-boggling. I've heard performance results between 25 and 40% over what, you know, AMD currently have. Just to be clear, I'm hearing that that is inclusive of clock frequencies as well. And I have heard that these may be able to hit 5.4 gigahertz overclocked, although... I wouldn't put a huge amount of stock in that yet because, again, we are talking super early silicon. So I don't also know whether that's all core or single core. I don't know. Um, and at the end of the day, again, this is really early silicon. I'm going to be super interested to see what comes of this because I'm sure that there's going to be a plethora, a multitude of leaks over the next several uh, several months as we kind of heading towards the release of these things. Naturally, the main next release that AMD are going to be putting out is the uh, 5800X 3D. By the way, what do you think down below? What do you think of that name? I think it's pretty cool. I don't know. I've heard some people really don't like it. For me, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and obviously, that is kind of a great indicator of perhaps some of the technology that AMD are going to be pushing for future processors hint 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 but as for those wondering what the performance metrics are compared to say older lake um we have grayman who actually put a tweet out asking how the performance of uh, zen 4 stacks up against older lake and evan actually ran um the same benchmark on his 12900k and you can see how they stack up yourself thanks to evan and credit to him and of course i'll link his uh, tweet in the description of the video just a quick stress again we do not know the state of what zen 4 is at here and that's again if these benchmarks are even true um, it's very possible that we're in a super, 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 super early engineering sample. Furthermore, this benchmark isn't... It's not the most accurate, to my understanding. I, I've i not really seen it used to benchmark processes, you know, like... Let's put it this way, it's not exactly used in, you know, average CPU review. That's all I'll say. Um, but anyway, switching from that, let's move to NVIDIA and a small update of a couple of their cards. So, according to website WCCF Tech, one of the products that was not shown off by NVIDIA at their recent CES event was the RTX 3080 12 gigabyte. I'm sure most of you at this point have heard the rumors of an NVIDIA GPU refresh. We've kind of seen it with their laptops, and yeah, there's been a plethora of rumors for not just an RTX 3080 uh, refresh, but also some of the 3070 products as well. Basically, one of the big differences between these, of course, is the amount of VRAM. According to what WCCF Tech are stating, of course, it has, well, <laughs> I'm going to shock you here. It's got 14 gigabytes of, no, not really. It's got 12 gigabytes of memory, and naturally, this is going to be GDDR6X as well. Um, 
we still have 70 SM cores. So it's a small increase. These, I believe, are the same rumors we've been hearing for some time now. So 8,960 CUDA cores. So basically, that's a grand spanking total of 3% increase in the number of active SMs. However, we do not know what the clock frequencies are yet. But the TDP is allegedly going to be kind of hungry, 350 watts. But thanks to the fact that it's got 12 gigabytes of memory, naturally we have, well, wider bus. So 384 bits. So apparently it's got 912 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. So that's a 20% increase over the 10 gigabyte. Now, what about pricing? That's going to be kind of the question. And, well, yeah... Obviously, MSRP is, yeah, well, MSRP is MSRP. However, allegedly, the idea here is that this card will slot between the RTX 3080 and 3080 Ti in the pricing stack. So, you know, let's say 100 to 200 bucks, at least if MSRP was being adhered to more than the standard reference RTX 3080. And availability or at the very least, the reveal of these GPUs is supposed to be the 11th of January or 12th of January. Now, I'll have to wait and see. Um, personally, I've not heard anything really about this yet from uh, my AIB sources. Uh, when I last spoke to them earlier this month, all, they, all they've basically told me is that they know things are going to be released. Uh, most of them, of course, are talking at the moment about the mouth-watering RTX 3090 Ti, which I have to say is absolutely ridiculous as a GPU. I mean, yeah, it's going to be expensive and hard to get, but damn. <laughs> like, seriously, that card is actually kind of ridiculous. Like, um, I don't just mean in terms of the specifications. Like, the specs are really cool, but it's more the engineering that kind of interests me. I think, like, while I'm really excited about the performance prospects about RDNA 3, it's, again, one of the things that I'm really interested in is just seeing the engineering and the work that's gone into these things, like the craftsmanship, you know, in everything. Like, power delivery, the, the, the you know, every, you know I, I don't want to start gushing. I'll be here for until, you know, the next couple of hours. But, um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what... Nvidia are going to be kind of announcing here and there are apparently more cards which are going to be uh, at least um, I'm, what I'm hearing anyway there's going to be more cards that may be announced on the 11th maybe we'll get some further details in the 3090 Ti Nvidia basically told us that there's going to be further details coming uh, after CES the 3090 Ti because or Thai, um, depending how you want to pronounce it at this stage because obviously they didn't reveal pricing I think that the 3050 could be a really cool card if availability is good. Um, I'm really hoping availability is good for the 3050 because I think while ray tracing is arguable on how useful it's going to be, DLSS is super duper useful, I suspect, on a card like this. It'll be very interesting to test that to see just what type of performance you can squeeze out of it. I suspect that 1080p, you know, with DLSS is going to be really, really high frame rates. So, anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, then, of course, you know what to do. Leave a lucky on the video, and I will see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.